The British 1st Airborne was disbanded entirely. Elements of the 6th Airborne, however, saw service in Palestine. Hostilities between Arabs and Jews increased in the immediate post-war years. It was a difficult peace to keep, and Britain's responsibility for Palestine ended in 1948. Most of the towns were out of bounds to us. We weren't allowed in them. We were in barbed wire camps, and we weren't allowed out the camps. It was like being in prison. You didn't have any leisure out there at all. Um, and uh, there were two or, two or three other lads got caught in some Jewish quarter and uh, we woke up, looked out of our tents one morning and there were these three, they'd strung them up on trees at the entrance of our camp. They'd hung them and uh, that was the sort of thing that was happening. So yeah, it was a, it was a bad time, Palestine. Soon the Paras were reduced to one brigade of men. The hot wars of the Cold War continued throughout the 1950s and 60s. British and American paras were in the midst of many of them. The paras would face one of their greatest post-war challenges in Egypt. In 1956, the Egyptian army, led by one Colonel Nasser, overthrew the government. Nasser became president and promptly nationalized the Suez Canal, still a vital link to Britain's Asian interests. He refused to accept the principle of uninterrupted use of the canal by ships of all nations. An ultimatum to the now warring Israelis and Egyptians was rebuffed. Britain decided to intervene, but here resources were limited. The RAF only had transports to lift 668 men. Still, Operation Musketeer, the invasion of Egypt, was ordered on November 5th. The men of three para left from Cyprus with seven jeeps, six 106 mm anti-tank guns, and numerous supply containers. They were bound for the Al Gamal airfield. They faced odds of five to one against them. The older men could remember the tense moments just before a drop. The younger soldiers could only steel themselves for combat. The atmosphere was, was quite electric in there. People were excited. I mean, by and large, we hadn't parachuted it, it, on an op jump. There were some of the older soldiers, seniors and such, who had, who were giving us the usual stories that we give to the youngsters now as they gave to us then, you know. But there was an air of excitement. And the main thing which struck me, that nobody was overly worried. We were going into Egypt. We'd been stationed there, most of us, for three years. We didn't have a high opinion, in general, of the Egyptian army. I know there were some units which were reasonably good, but in general, we didn't think much of them. We didn't honestly think it would be too difficult, and there was excitement, and, you know, and everybody was, was keen to go. A Company soon captured the control tower and support buildings, whilst B Company landed on top of the Egyptian defences on the eastern end of the airfield. Within half an hour, the airfield was in British hands, but it was all for nothing. The Americans and the Russians both viewed the invasion as neo-imperialism and forced an end to the operation. Meanwhile, the British had their hands full in Cyprus. A guerrilla war was being conducted against British control. The guerrillas were considered terrorists by the British Army. British paras played their part in pushing the guerrillas into the hills, where they were unrelentlessly pursued. The operation continued until 1958, when a truce was declared. Cyprus received independence in 1964, but the paras' job was not over. The island's Turk and Greek communities were fighting each other, and the British tried to maintain order. A semblance of stability was achieved, but not peace. Ultimately, a United Nations force was established, and most of the British paras withdrew. In the war in Vietnam, with very limited success, the British were doing battle in the Middle East. A tribal rebellion had broken out in the remote Radvan region of Aden, here, in the rugged and hostile terrain, tribesmen, backed by Egypt and Yemen, threatened the peace of the Saudi Peninsula. 
The focus of much of their activity was harassment of travelers on the Dala Road, a main route to Mecca. As the turmoil increased, British forces in the region reorganized and para-units were sent in to restore order. The remainder of the battalion was then brought down. B Company had to go back to preserve a presence in the Gulf. And uh, I was ordered to uh, get onto the heights above the, the Wadi Dibsan um, to show the tribesmen that we could go wherever we wanted. And we did that by a night march, which outsmarted them because they were not used to fighting by night, um, and then by sweeping them off uh, by day. It was then decided that further than that, we would go down into the Wadi Dibsan to destroy their food stocks, uh, to teach them a lesson. Well, once again, we came down into the Wadi by night, going down some pretty steep slopes. But having got down there, uh, we continued in daylight. I had a company of Royal Marines with me, and uh, a minor error occurred amongst one of their, one of their reporters, um, who announced he was 10,000 yards ahead of his actual position. <clears throat> Scarcely able to believe this, I, I, I left the brigadier. He and I were together when this news came in. Um, I went off in my helicopter, piloted by Major Jake Jackson, the Army Air Corps. Um, and uh, we'd only gone about 5,000 yards forward when I saw uh, Red Farnies with their rifles on either side of the cliffs who were shooting at us, and it was quite plain that um, we had to turn back. We were then hit. The pilot very skillfully managed to bring the, the pilot just back inside uh, the range of my own weapons. And uh, thankfully, from my point of view, the Remy corporals who came up that night to work on it got it fit for flight, and it got out the next day. Nonetheless, apart from those uh, adventures, um, the battalion advanced to all its objectives, and the Red Farnies realized that they were not going to be able to hide in the hills indefinitely and stay out of the way. In numerous actions in the weeks that followed, the Paras were to demonstrate the unique fighting qualities that had served them so well since the early 1940s, primarily an ability to operate far from base with limited outside support. Long days of patrolling through the hills maintained a presence that the tribesmen could not ignore. It was tough going in the desperate heat of the desert. They would have to survive with the limited food and water that they could carry. They would have to prove to the rebels that they could not just match them in the desert, but be even tougher. was established by the Paras and other army units. But ultimately, British policy in the region changed and British forces were withdrawn.